In this video I'd like to take a look at the normal schools that started popping up in the 1800s around North America. I've got a collection of them here for you. This one's in Nebraska. It's an interesting phenomenon. Let's have a look at uh, some of the history on this. Of course we have a backstory. Uh, 1839 they're giving the date for the first normal school um, Lexington, Massachusetts, eventually becoming Framingham Un State University, um, or a part of it. Um, you'll find this narrative throughout uh, the normal schools. The schools that you'll see you might recognize them as a current university building, uh, but originally um, intended as one of these. Um, and basically what it was, was uh, the implementation of formal education throughout North America. Um, and the normal schools were intended to train the teachers um, to instill the norms uh, include it says here included historical behavioral no behavioral norms of the time so they're implementing what was normal for the time um, and we put that in the context of the reset um, mud flood researching um, it's interesting because what we are seeing and what we are implying I guess is that uh, there was some sort of reset of history and of conventional knowledge and also the use of um, of buildings from the civilization that existed previous to that so let's have a look at some of these normal schools and I have quite a few pictures here for you um, so I'll probably move fairly quickly feel free to pause and have a closer look if you like They are interesting because for the architecture of the time, again, we see this, uh, this style of architecture used for other types of buildings um, with official names. Uh, a lot of these two, these normal schools are um, looking very rural or isolated. They don't look like they have much else around them at the time. So it's uh, interesting that the narrative is telling us that all these popped up for the purpose of uh, teaching teachers so the teachers could teach the youth and they were for primarily for uh, primary schools um, the teachers of children uh, which is an interesting part of the narrative as well um, when you tie that into uh, the orphan trains uh, the incubator babies and all the rest of that interesting uh, alternative history that's now popping up So you get that sense of uh, isolation for the building here itself, but you have this the dome tech popping up. You have the gate on the roof again. So familiar technology or architecture um, that we see in other types of buildings that we've looked at here on this channel. Uh, Texas, this one, New Hampshire. There you see the children. Uh, I would suspect at the time this photo was taken, it, be, it being used as a school for children. And you start to get a lot of these as well, castle looking buildings. Again, very castle looking. Oklahoma, and again, looks very rural. You look around it, it feels like it's in the middle of a field somewhere. Um, destroyed by fire, of course, like so many of them have been. Just destroyed by fire or demolished. Uh, let's dig a little deeper into the narrative. We're back on the, uh, this page is from um, the Center for Rule of Law dot org. Um, so this Cyrus um, Purse is how they pronounce it. Uh, supposedly the uh, thought behind the normal school concept. Um, and it really links in with the historical narrative of how, how schools actually came to uh, become a major part of our existence. Uh, this character here, Horace Mann, pops up as a major reformer in the school system. Well, let's look at Horace Mann, uh, the creation of the common school. So you have the words common, you have the words normal. Very interesting wording, I find, with those um, and the types of um, thought that they were trying to seed across the realm, not just in North America, although this, this video focuses on North America. 
So they call him the father of the common school movement. And I don't want to get into too much detail here. There's definitely a religious aspect to his cause. Um, and uh, religious power behind the movement. Of course. So let's look at a few more. Starting to see very familiar architecture and the mud flood type evidence here. So, a lot of buildings, and I, all I've got is a handful in this collection. A lot of buildings all over North America, and I would suspect beyond. Now, they do say the whole concept began. Um, in France and then was implemented in North America in the 1800s again that 1800s timeline popping into existence this one in Idaho always in the mid 1800s where it feels so foggy um, in our historical narrative there isn't much going on there um, that jumps out at you so you have these what I, what I propose um, is that these were repurposed buildings from a previous civilization um, and then repurposed as, in this case, normal schools to normalize the formal education system of the new world, uh, the new normal. And... You also see them; these types of buildings repurposed as asylums very commonly. Um, and of course, you know, more official type city, the ones especially in the city centers, um, designated as um, government buildings, post offices, banks, hotels. This one in Illinois. Uh, definitely getting the feeling here that this is not a new build. That this, all this here looks well grown in. So I don't have a lot of dates. I'll sh I'm sure they could be looked up, but it gets pretty hazy. This one in Jersey City. But again, if you use your eyes and a bit of common sense, the official narrative starts to fall apart. This one pretty blurry. And then you have to begin to ask the question, is, what is a building like this? This is a Maryland. What is a building like this? Looking so pristine. Um, doing in the middle of what looks to like be nowhere. Um, and being built for the purpose of teaching teachers. Mamako? I don't know where that is. If anyone does um, throw a comment in. I'd like to hear from somebody from here. Here it is again. This one says Mankato, so I'm not sure on this one. Well, I know very blurry New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, or New Brunswick, Canada, sorry. Newark. Cheney. And as you're probably gathering, these are everywhere, and they are nothing anywhere near shabby as far as the construction of these. So a lot, of, a large part of our narrative is asking us to believe that these workers, builders, um, you know, brickies, carpenters, finished carpenters, painters, all of these people who existed in the mid 1800s um, were just really really good at what they did and were willing to work all day for very little um, not gain any social status since we don't really know who any of them were um, and not really be applauded for the the works that they created it doesn't it doesn't fly with me um, if I had been a part of building something like this, 
I would want that to be known and I would think that people would appreciate the construction of such beauty and celebrate it but it just seems to be something where these buildings pop up and the narrative um, expects us to believe that they were just thrown up uh, often in a year or two and we're talking about buildings that are constructed of brick and stone um, a lot of uh, iron beams um, and then the interiors of course finished off with plaster and painted and the uh, the type of woodwork finishes we see in a lot of these buildings um, would be very very difficult to perform and duplicate these days and we're expecting the people of the mid 1800s to have had these abilities without the use of power by the way so it's a stretch in my opinion it's a stretch and I think we have a, a valid argument in this case anyway back to the normal schools uh, let's uh, have a another look at some more information here we're still on the Horace Mann page here this is on social welfare library um, dot VCU Virginia Commonwealth University uh, there's a little blurb here at the bottom that I find interesting you know history is divided between people who um, Let's see here. They say that some people support what the, what they were doing with this movement as an important step toward a more open and fluid society in which merit would trump birth. Although hmm. others, other historians view common school as a rather blunt tool for social control, one that tended both to stifle intellectual curiosity and to suppress diversity. And I would be in this camp here, and I would suggest that. It was definitely used as an intentional tool, more so than we realized. And one last little bit from encyclopedia.com on normal schools. You can have a look through that yourself. Um, they go through a lot of the similar history. Whenever you research this kind of stuff, the first page or two is always the same story. Everybody gets it from the same source, so it starts to look like the same story. Um, this little blurb though talking a little bit more about how they were focused on character and morality and instilling these values into the children of the time, the youth of the time. Um, interesting how they're describing it as a cloistered atmosphere similar to um, what it would be like to be in a convent or something like that. Um, so again that uh, church narrative popping in. Go through a few more here. You've seen a couple from Canada and then across the states, north, northwest, east, south. Uh, Ter Terry Hout, Indiana. Hope that's how you, I hope I got that right. I think we'll end on this one. This one's a, a gem for sure. And again, remember, you're expected to believe that this was created for the purposes of training teachers to teach the narrative, the accepted narrative of the time, um, normal schools to normalize uh, a specific way of thinking. So this has been my thoughts on the subject and it's, I don't know much about it. If you know any more about normal schools, uh, please uh, feel free to comment. I'm always interested in the interaction. I hope you enjoyed this video. I thank you for watching.